This is episode 63. This is the business of architecture. Helping architects conquer the world. And here's your host, Enoch Sears. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. I am your host, Enoch Bartlett Sears, and today we have a special guest on. I'm taking a departure from my usual lineup. Today we're going outside the architectural field. Our guest is one of the nation's top thinkers. He's a Stanford-trained scientist and has been named by Forbes magazine as one of 10 gurus you should know. His name is Dr. B.J. Fogg. Dr. Fogg is the founder and director of the Behavior Design Lab at Stanford University. I've been talking with Dr. Fogg and I wanted to bring him on the show today because I think you'll find a lot of value in what he has to offer. Today we'll be talking about psychology, the truth behind acquiring new habits, and some of the myths of behavior change. If you've ever wanted to achieve more success in your life but haven't been able to get past your invisible roadblocks, you'll want to take out a notepad and paper for this interview. Now, I know that behavior change is not directly related to architecture, but I think it's such a key aspect to our success in our lives that I just didn't want to pass up this opportunity to have Dr. Fogg on the show. In addition to behavior change, we discuss time management, and Dr. Fogg reveals his personal strategy for getting more done in a day and achieving the big wins in his life, the strategy he has been spending the past 20 years developing. One last note, BJ Fogg has developed a free online course to help people acquire new habits. In this course, you'll learn the process for creating a new habit that can change your life forever. That's in five days. And in 30 minutes, you'll learn the skills that will benefit you for a lifetime. I know because it worked for me. You can find out more at tinyhabits.com. Before we jump into today's interview, I just wanted to remind you to get on the early access list for tickets to the Business of Architecture Conference. It will be two solid days of intense business training. All sessions will be recorded so you can view them at any time. But you need to be on the early bird notification list to get the early bird pricing. That will be held in the middle of October. You can go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash conference for additional details. And with that, I'd like to welcome Dr. BJ Fogg to the show. Hey, it's good to talk to you. Is it all right if I call you BJ? Yeah, of course. Okay. <laughs> well, you've, you've done some, some groundbreaking studies about persuasion and about behavior change. Give us, you know, for someone that might not have be familiar with your research, would you just give it to us in a nutshell? Wow. Wow, wow, wow. I'm not sure there is a nutshell, but I'll try. Okay. Um, what, I'm, what I've been doing the last 10 years is looking at ways to understand human behavior change in a systematic way, not, uh, not as guesswork or not as intuition, but here's systematically how human behavior changes and here's how you design for it. I think that's a pretty good overview. Before that, I was uh, really focused on, you know, uh, how technology, computers, and all sorts of technology could persuade people. And that was sort of in a, uh, I might say, previous life. I've never said that before. But it, that was like the 90s and uh, up to about 2003 or four. that was my focus, where I was the first scientist to do experiments to show that computers could influence your thoughts and your behaviors in the web as well and so on. But with time, I transitioned my work to be less about the technology because that's, I think, just a given now. It's it's understood that technology is changing us. uh, And it's more about, my work is more about human psychology, whether it gets, you know, whether the product or program comes to you through technology or not. So it's, it's more about a fundamental understanding of, of humans. Yeah. All my life I've seen campaigns about not smoking or eating mm-hmm. healthy, and mm-hmm. yet I know that few of us heed these warnings. Can you give us some insight into why not? Wow. That's, um, <laughs> you know, let, let me answer that question with an answer you don't expect, but I think it's a good way to frame what we're talking about. When it comes to behavior and behavior change, it's very, it's the wrong thing to clump it all into one thing. That would be like talking about cooking as all one thing. 
And in fact, I think cooking is a very good metaphor. And so one, one of the things I've been doing is helping outline or helping map out the different ways behaviors can change. And I think there are 15 ways behaviors can change. And each one has a different approach, a different psychology. And 15, it's basically a grid. It's like a periodic table of elements, except for, for behaviors. And it's a five by three grid. And so there are some behaviors that are about getting people to stop, like stop smoking. And that's very different than getting people to start recycling. And those are, and you would take different approaches. So part of what I think my work has done and is doing more and more is it's helping people think clearly about behavior change. And instead of lumping it all together and to be able to uh, identify, oh, this is the type we're going for of the 15. This is the one type. And now we can focus on the approaches for this one type rather than getting confused and using the wrong approach. So to, to kind of drill down onto uh, or to answer your question a little more directly, there are some campaigns that work and some that don't. Um, the, you know, if I go back in the day to when you know, I was growing up in Fresno, California, I remember there was a big anti-litter campaign going on. You know, give a hoot, don't pollute, and things like that. And there was a lot of environmental kind of stuff. And it did work over time. It absolutely worked. Um, where the culture shifted and, um, you know, nowadays, I mean, when I was a kid, you wouldn't think really very much of throwing a McDonald's wrapper or an empty pop can out the car window. And that sounds shocking now. And I am not that old. Yeah. Right. So, but now that would just be crazy. You wouldn't even think of it. So I, you know, things like that, the cultural shifts take some time. The individual level behavior changes can happen really quite quickly if you have the right approach. Yeah. Well, let's, since you mentioned there, you obviously have a very complex behavior grid, and I'm looking at it right here in terms of, you know, separating the different kind of behavior changes. Maybe we can talk about something that would be relevant to our audience and some of the challenges Great. they face in working with clients. Great. Now, Enoch, you're killing me by saying it's complicated. So Am I? I'm, I'm sorry. It... <laughs> I worked very hard to simplify. Um, it, yes, we, we, it, um, I just don't want to scare off people from looking at it and thinking about it because it's, it's pretty straightforward. If you understand how grids work, uh, so anybody who's listening to this, uh, just, you know, just it's, it's a grid and there's columns and rows, but you do have to read, you know, think, okay, how does this one, you know, this thing called blue path, what does blue mean? Blue means it's a familiar behavior. Path means you do it from now on. Uh, it used to be really complicated, and you might have seen that version. There were 35 cells. It was a five by seven, and that's actually the academic paper. And maybe you saw that one. The academic paper has 35 cells in the grid, and I I did decide that was too complicated. I thought, this is over designed. It can be simpler. Let me really work hard at making it easier. Excellent. Well, one of the challenges that if and maybe you can tell me where this would fit in the behavior grid that architects face is persuading clients, you know, as professionals, we possess a great amount of knowledge as any professional does that our clients don't have. And a lot of times there's a, they're not necessarily going to trust what we're saying or necessarily believe hmm. it just because we say it. Yeah. So for instance, maybe we want to persuade uh, our clients on the importance of good design, how maybe spending more money up front will save them money in the long term. So it, it requires sort of a, a shift in thinking of the client. Is that something that could be placed into yeah. the behavior grid? Yeah, I think absolutely. And I'm a big fan of taking the abstraction and getting more specific. Uh, so let me take your question and let's and I'll, I'll make it more specific. Please. So you want your client to go, say, $30,000 above their budget because it's going to be, it's a great investment. It's going to be way better. And you truly believe that you have to get them to say yes to that. Yeah. So then they're saying yes to it as a one-time behavior. So I call that a dot, you know, a long-term behavior that you do over and over. I call a path, like, you know, you're walking on a path. A dot is something you do once. And then because your client probably hasn't done this before, it would be, it would be a green behavior. Uh, something they've done before, like buy a book on Amazon, 
or go to dinner at a restaurant they're familiar with is a blue behavior. But this is a green behavior because uh, they haven't done this quite before. And with green behaviors, there are two things going on that matter that you have to think about. One is anxiety. So when you're trying to get them to say yes to exceed their budget, they're going to be anxious about it. Now, that's not the case so much with blue behaviors. If you know, you're not anxious about buying a book on Amazon or going to a restaurant that you already know. So as you uh, try to get them to say yes, you have to account for their anxiety, their fear, you know, what, what's holding them back. And then the other factor with green behaviors is they don't know how to do it. So there's a know-how issue. Now, in this case, it may not be so relevant, the know-how issue. It, it's more relevant in something like, you know, somebody wants you to go skydiving. Well, you've never been skydiving, you're anxious, and you don't know how. So if there's a know-how issue, you have to do a lot of hand-holding and, you know, step-by-step, step, here's how you do it. So I would put that example as a green dot behavior, green because it's new, dot because it's one time, and you can hone in on and say, well, to help them say yes to this, we're really going to have to address the anxiety issue and help them get over the fear or whatever makes them nervous about this. What would be some strategies that you have seen use in terms of the green dot to kind of help us to understand how we might approach this process? Yeah. Well, the way I would think about it is hope versus fear. Uh, so as I look at, so I have a new way of looking at motivation and there's three factors and one of them is hope and fear. So it's two sides of the same coin. And in this case, they're fearful that, you know, so I, I would list out, what are they fearful of? Well, they're fearful that <laughs> they're going to like uh, get in a compromised financial position, that the money is going to be wasted, that it's going to maybe take too long if they, you know, do X, Y, and Z. And on the flip side, you have hope, you know, uh, hope that it'll be a cooler design, they'll be happier in the space and things like that. So what you can do is you can either try to boost hope or you can try to reduce fear. And either one will help them say yes. In this case, I think the better approach, a lot of people would dive in and try to boost hope and say, oh, it's gonna be so great and it's gonna be so awesome. I would first address the fear issues because as you reduce, I think fear and hope are vectors pushing against each other. And if you reduce the fear, the hope naturally emerges. Uh, if you don't, the tension between hope and fear just gets stronger and stronger wow, I really, really want this. I'm really hopeful for it, but I'm still fearful. And there's just going to be a lot of, you know, think of these vectors crushing each other. So I would really try to reduce their fear and anxiety around doing it. And you can do that through, uh, first of all, getting it on the table, helping them recognize what's going on. Uh, two, um, you know, just getting the facts out. Uh, I'm a big fan of you know, don't, don't worry, don't be fearful about abstractions. What are the facts? You know, laying out the facts, walking everybody through the facts. Um, and then a different approach to it is, so, so that's a very kind of logical, analytical approach. A more emotional approach would be to have them connect with somebody who did the very behavior that you want them to do, exceeded their budget, Wow, I shouldn't have picked that one because that's bad because you don't want people to exceed their budgets, but let's keep going with it. You, what you would do is you would connect them with somebody who has been there before and they did it and they're like, oh my gosh, it was terrific. You know, so you, uh, that's a more emotional approach rather than the, the dollar, you know, the calculations. It's here's somebody just like you, they've been in your position, they did this and now here's what, you know, here was the result for them. I'd like to follow up with that and ask, kind of turn the conversation around a little bit, BJ, and ask a question regarding the way that you structure your personal time. So moving from your research to the personal way you implement, you know, the knowledge that you've gained over your over your life. And one of the things I'm interested in, you know, as we've connected, it seems that you have a very concrete not to do list. Yeah. Well, yeah, I'm not sure it's written out, but the 
I prioritize every day, every week. I'm very systematic at prioritizing. Well, can you <laughs> can you share with me some of painful. some of your personal things that yeah. you see as uh, enabling you to to do everything that you do and have success? Wow, you know, I'm not sure I'm, I'm the world's expert on this, but I do get a lot done, and I do prioritize very very hard. And I, you know, sometimes when it it feels hard, I think. Oh, I'm prioritizing so hard it hurts. It really does hurt because mm-hmm. it means you have to say no to stuff. Um, what I do is this. Uh, my morning my morning routine is um, I have a very set morning routine. I do this. I check this email. I do this, 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 this. And that's just all habit built into me. I get through that because uh, I have to do that every day. It includes a little bit of meditation and stuff like that. And then I look at uh, kind of my to do's and I actually write one per little sticker. <laughs> I should share this like more. Um, I saw every time I have a task I want to do, I don't leave it in my inbox or on a list. I put it on a little sticker and then I have this book that the stickers go into. It's like a little post-it, but a kind of plasticky kind of post-it and I have to have a special pen that works on it, but it could be any kind of sticker. And then in the day, I have one page that's devoted, here's what I'm doing today, one page that's, here's what I'm doing tomorrow, and then I have different pages for different projects. And as I look at my day and what I'm doing, I take those stickers and I move them around according to which ones I'm going to focus on. And the ones in the top are the ones that I'm for sure going to get done today. And the ones in the bottom that are kind of nice to have, and the ones that are on the page tomorrow, I don't have to think about until tomorrow. Um... And then sometimes, like today, it's a very big day for me. Uh, I will go to some of the stickers and put time estimates on them, five minutes and 10 minutes. Uh, And so in the set of things I have to get done, my approach is to knock off the short ones really, really fast. You know, five minutes, 10 minutes, get them done. So then uh, I end up having time to focus on the must-do, more thoughtful, longer projects. And I don't feel like I have a bunch of things hanging over my head. I, you know, that's my approach. I'm not sure it's the best in the world. It works for me yep. because it allows me to prioritize and reprioritize very quickly. Other people would say, no, do your hardest project in the morning and leave all those little ones for later or whatever. Yep. But that's what works for me. You mentioned that you have a separate page for projects as opposed to days. Yeah. Can you just tell me how those two relate? Yeah. So one of the things uh, I'm doing right now is called Tiny Habits which is uh, a program, a very effective program in helping people create habits. I did not intend this to be a project three years ago. It was just, it's basically a discovery I made about how to change your behavior without willpower. And it's really simple and it's really fast. And it's, it's turned into a company, basically. And we have coaches and we have, you know, we have hundreds, what I've trained now, 22,000 people in the method and so on. Anyway, so I have projects to do around tiny habits. So I have a a page that's specifically for that. Um, I teach boot camps in behavior design, which is kind of um, a very high quality training for two days with 12 people at my guest home. I do about one a month. And so I have projects around that. For example, one of the things I need to for for boot camp today is I'm going to record a welcome video for people coming next week. So that's one thing I need to make sure I get done. And then I need to, on boot camp, look at the, we have this timeline, this spreadsheet of about 120 things that need to happen before boot camp that I share with other people. And I need to go review the spreadsheet and look down it to make sure, you know, and that tracks us day by day, every day, you know, 30 days before boot camp, what do we do? 21 days, you know, 19 days, 18 days. And so I'll go review that today to make sure I'm on track and add a little sticky note if there is something that I need to be doing uh, that's on the timeline that I somehow missed. So, um, and then I have projects in my Stanford lab um, that I, you know, to keep that lab moving forward in our research there. So I just found it helpful to have a separate a separate page, but that's, it's not about the page. It's about, I'm going to put myself in tiny habits land for the next hour and crank out tiny habit stuff 
Then I'm going to put on a different hat and think about boot camp. And then I'm going to put on a different hat and work on my lab stuff. So instead of switching, like inboxes make a switch from this to that to this to that. And it gets really tiring for me. Yeah. So I like getting in a frame like this is all about tiny habits and then moving on to the next one. And you found that your system works pretty well for you or are there parts yeah. of it that you're still looking to improve? Well, I've been working on it for about 20 years. Uh, so, uh, and it used to be on index. I mean, the form factor has shifted and shifted. I, I think I'm at a pretty stable state right now. Uh, what I'm doing now, <laughs> this is really detailed, but what I'm doing now to make it better, instead of writing on little stickers, I have ways to print on them on my printer. And what I like about that is well, they're printed and they look cooler and they're more readable. And, and there's a lot of stickers that I reuse. Um, and so I've been put some time into printing those up. So I still handwrite them. Like this morning, I probably hand wrote eight or nine. But if I reuse them a lot, I will print them. And then they look, they just look cooler, you know, that they're printed up. Okay, so let's say someone <laughs> wants to change... A behavior they want to get better at time management that is a challenge yeah. that uh, I know a lot of architects struggle with how would they start implementing something like your system using your yeah. any one of your models well I would suggest uh, what I would do if that were if I were working with somebody or if that were my thing I would first sit down well I'd first get a really good timer and I just posted to Twitter a timer that I love it's a little cooking timer that's very small and I can put it in my pocket and it has a magnet on the back. I'm a huge fan of saying for the next, like this morning, I wanted to get a, a new website at bjfog.org and post some new stuff. And I was like, okay, I'm going to do this in 17 minutes. I started the timer because uh, what I didn't want to do is get into a rat's nest on the project. And, you know, when the, if the timer were to go off and I wasn't done, I would reevaluate. Do I keep doing this or am I stuck? Mm. Well, it turned out I finished, I looked down and I had 30 seconds left. I was like, <laughs> terrific, right? I'm not always that good at predicting how long it's going to take, but, um, you know, thinking through how much time am I giving this? I set the timer. I work away on it. Um, it, it I think it helps me and it helps me stay on task because I'm not thinking I have all day to do. I have 17 minutes to get up, up a new website. And so, bam. So that helps me out. So get a new timer. But the more general approach is, I, I, is this, to you know, sit down for 20 minutes and write on index cards or small cards. If you could w wave a magic wand and change your behavior in any way to be more productive, what would you do? And so write one behavior per card and I'd brainstorm 20 or 30 different behaviors then I would go back and sort the cards and select two or three of them that have these characteristics. Number one, it would have high impact. They would get, truly make you more productive. And then number two, ones that you can get yourself to do. And I have this method, I call it focus mapping. And oh, in probably three weeks. Uh, there'll be something at focusmapping.com where I explain the method a little bit more. But basically, it's a two-dimensional landscape where you put toward the top the items that have high impact on the goal, being pr in this case, being productive. And then toward the right, you slide items over that you can get yourself to do. In other words, it, um, it's not useful. So in the upper left-hand corner would be items that would have high impact, but you'll, you can't get yourself to do it. How would you determine uh, what you can get yourself to do? Just gut reality check. You look at it and say, oh, okay. get up at four every morning. Yeah, I'd be super productive. Can I get myself to do it? Nope. That's <laughs> way on the left. Whereas by myself, a really cool task timer. Yeah, make me more productive. Can you get myself to do it? Yeah, that's easy. That's two minutes. Bam, that goes on the right. It may not be at the very top, but it would be on the right. So that, that dimension is a, rea the, the, you know, the left to right horizontal dimension is a reality check. You know, can I really get myself to do this or not? So what you end up with, is, so you've brainstormed a whole bunch of different behaviors, and then you end up with a small set of realistic behaviors that will have impact. And then you focus on those. Okay. 
BJ, I am a I'm a graduate of your Tiny Habits program, and I can say that I've successfully completed it about a year ago. Uh, my goal was to be able to, as silly as this may sound, to floss my teeth every day. You know, because we all hear the dentist tell us, "Man, you need yeah. a floss." <laughs> I've I've kept up that habit, and I'm Good happy to report that the dentist they they're just amazed every time I come in that uh, <laughs> that I'm flossing my teeth. Nice. So I wonder. Yeah, good for you. Yeah. So, t- can you tell our audience about the Tiny Habits program, what that is, and yeah. invite them so they can figure out how they can have similar things in their life happen? Yeah, you know, this program, the Tiny Habits Method, is such a. I don't know. I'm just so happy to be able to share it with people. Like I said, it was an accident. I, I, I was just goofing around with my own behavior, you know, because I, I think about behavior constantly, and I have for years and years. And then the, I started goofing around with this new way of creating behaviors, and it really worked well for me. And so then I decided to share it with, oh, five or six friends. And then it just kind of exploded from there. And the way it works is this. Um, you pick a behavior that you want in your life, and you scale it back to be really, really small. So let's say you want to do, you know, floss your teeth. And instead of flossing all your teeth, you scale it back to the tiniest version of it. Oh, I'll just floss one tooth. And the thinking and the insight I had was, well, you know, you already know how to floss all your teeth. What you don't know is how to make it automatic. And so instead of focusing on the skill or task of flossing all your teeth, you're focusing on the skill of making it automatic. And that's what I goofed around with for a few years. And what I learned is if I sequence this new tiny behavior after something I already do, then that existing routine becomes my reminder or my prompt to do the new behavior. And flossing one tooth fits really well after brushing. So there's this phrase, this way to phrase things that we call a recipe in tiny habits. And the recipe goes like this. After I brush my teeth, I will floss one tooth. And so you craft that recipe, and then you just practice it. And as you floss one tooth, when you're done, uh, you do this thing that I call celebrating, which is you just say, good for me, or way to go, or you smile at yourself in the mirror. You do something to fire up a positive emotion, and I call that celebrating. You call it whatever you want. But the importance of that is the more, the stronger the positive emotion you feel, as you're doing the behavior or immediately after, the faster the habit will form. And so for, I know that about half the people that do tiny habits feel like the celebration piece is kind of odd and weird, but that's how you make it automatic. And the people that are good at celebrating, and you must be good for you, I am too, for whatever weird reason, um, you have, you'll have the ability to form habits very quickly. Well, Dr. Fogg, thank you for joining us on Business of Architecture. I just wanted to tell our audience that I will put the Behavior Grid by BJ Fogg up on the website so you can follow along with our conversation. And it's been really interesting talking to you about, especially about your time productivity habits, because that was something I didn't know before. And it's interesting to get a sneak peek into how you organize (laughs) your life. Yeah, well, you know, it's a big, yeah. It's interesting to trade, uh, to see how other people are doing things. I'm always in learning mode. I'm always, and this is very much tiny habits. And maybe that's just, you know, it's like, I never feel like I have it perfectly figured out. And so I'm always open to new ideas. And even as a scientist, I've said, you know, when people propose crazy things, it's like, you know what, you have to be open to new ideas as a scientist, or you won't discover anything. And so I think that's part of being a good scientist, probably a good designer, probably a good architect, is staying open to new ideas, always being in learning mode. So I'll, I guess I'll wrap with that. Thanks, Enoch, for having me. Yeah, can, I'd like to just ask one follow-up question, BJ. Okay. What are the ideas right now that you're most excited about? Oh, wow. Let's see. I Let's see. Lots, lots of them. Um, one <laughs> Maybe, of them, okay. I know, but see, I have to prioritize them. Yep, this is yep. why it's so painful. I mean, I can't do this for a while. Um, one thing I've been working on yesterday and this morning is a new format for short books that I will probably be shipping a book tomorrow. So I've innovated and I had to get one of my former students to help me because technically it was pretty hard and it will play very well on mobile. 
It'll work very well on mobile and um, yeah, it, there'll be free little books. So I'm excited about that because it's just like very excited because I think that's the future. Um, next, I am, you know, all this stuff we're doing at Tiny Habits and training Tiny Habits coaches is super exciting. Um, but in about three weeks, I think I'll have some bandwidth to create a product or a, an experience that'll be behavior change for medical doctors where I will start figuring out how to train medical doctors and how to change human behavior. And I got some initial signups for that, some interest. So as soon as I get a little more time, I'll start teaching that and eventually have a course to help MDs uh, get better at understanding human behavior and changing. I'm really excited about that because, um, well, because some of the medical doctors who have come to my boot camp um, they say, BJ, oh my gosh, we went to all this medical school. We learned nothing about human behavior. We learned all this stuff about Krebs cycle and Grignard reactions, and we never use that. And what we need every day is behavior change stuff. And so I'm excited to kind of fill that gap for them. You know, I think you could say that about just about every field. It seems there hmm. is a big void there. Hmm. Well, well, we'll start with MDs, or yep. at least that's, that's the one that I think... <sighs> They, well, especially with the changes in the healthcare and things like that, the MDs are agents of change. They need to be better at it. And some of them, not all of them, but some of them are really eager. And so we'll see where that goes. Great. It's been great having you on the show, PJ. Thanks, Enoch. Fun to talk to you. Have a great day. Goodbye. Goodbye. And that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture. To get more resources about how you, as an architect, can run a rewarding business that is both fun, flexible, and profitable, visit businessofarchitecture.com and click the Join button to claim your free account to Business of Architecture Insider. As a member, you'll have access to free tools and resources to help you get more clients, start a new firm, and much more. You'll also get access to my book, Social Media for Architects, where you'll learn how to use Internet tools for fun and for profit. Until next week, this has been The Business of Architecture. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, Do It Anyway.